cathode ray tube. Discovery William Crookes discovered cathode rays when he was studying electrical discharge in gases, whereas J. J. Thomson discovered that the cathode ray consists of negatively charged particles called electrons. Production Cathode rays are produced in a discharge tube. Hence, the discharge tube is generally referred to as the cathode ray tube. The cathode ray tube is a partially evacuated glass tube with cathode and anode placed at the ends of the tube. A vacuum pump is used to partially evacuate the tube. The cathode is connected to the power source with the help of a clip. The tube is supported on a stand. It was found that electric discharge through gases took place only when the pressure inside the tube is lowered and the potential difference between the electrodes was high. To produce cathode rays, high potential difference of 10 kV to 20 kV is applied between the electrodes and the pressure is reduced to 0 0.0001 mm of mercury by means of a vacuum pump. A glow is seen on the walls of the glass tube. The bright fluorescence glow is due to the striking of the rays emitted by the cathode. These rays are cathode rays. Properties of cathode rays Cathode rays travel in straight lines. When an opaque object is placed in the path of the cathode rays, a shadow is cast on the glass wall opposite to the cathode. This shows that cathode rays travel in straight lines. Cathode rays consist of negatively charged particles. The rays deflect towards the positive plate when the tube is exposed to an electric field. This is because the negatively charged particles in the cathode rays get attracted towards the positive plate. Cathode rays are deflected by the magnetic field. When the tube is exposed to a magnetic field, the cathode rays follow a curved path showing that they are deflected by the magnetic field. Cathode rays produce X-rays when they impinge on a metal with a high atomic weight. Cathode rays travel with a high speed almost equal to the speed of the light and hence possess kinetic energy. When cathode rays are made to fall on a paddle wheel, the wheel starts rotating showing that the rays possess kinetic energy. To demonstrate a Crookes tube, a cathode ray tube, we need a high voltage power source such as this one. We need the Crookes tube which has a metal cathode, a metal anode, a screen that has been coated with a phosphorescent material that gives off light when struck by electrons, and a bar magnet. As we turn on the screen, we notice that electrons are emitted from the cathode and as they strike the fluorescent screen we're able to see the cathode ray, this stream of electrons illuminated. We can use a magnet to show the deflection of that stream. Here we can see the electrons being deflected by the magnet. The cathode ray moves upward. If we reverse the magnet, we would predict that the beam would be deflected in the opposite direction. And we observe that the beam is deflected downward. Okay, this is a cathode ray tube. What it essentially is, it's a 
vacuum chamber. There are no gases inside this glass tube. Uh, the only thing we have are two electrodes, one's called the cathode, the other's called the anode, and a fluorescent screen um, in the background. It's coated with some type of fluorescent material. When I turn the power supply on, we'll see a beam that, is, that causes that fluorescent screen to glow. Looks like a nice straight line, doesn't it? We call that a cathode ray because it emanates or begins at the cathode and shoots across over to the anode. J.J. Thompson was working with cathode rays. We really didn't understand what they were. I mean, we have electricity going in one side and coming out the other, but there's nothing inside to conduct it. It's a vacuum tube. So he decided to apply a magnetic field um, to this cathode ray, and he found something interesting. Let me apply one pole of the magnet to this beam, and we'll see what it does, and then we'll flip it around and see what the other pole does. This is my favorite part. Can you see what's happening to that beam? What does it appear as though it's happening to it? It's moving. It's moving. It's being repelled, isn't it, by the magnet? Let me flip the magnet around, and what do you think is going to happen this time? Well, if it's being attracted on one pole, see how it's being attracted there? Let me rotate it so the kids on the, this side of the room can see it. See how it's being attracted there? And then the other pole, do you see how it's being pushed down? What does that tell me about that beam? It has a what? It has a charge. Let me tell you about the poles of the magnet. The one that pushes it away is the negative pole. So what does that tell you about the charge of those particles? Negative. Negatively charged particles. And J.J. Thompson was actually able uh, to do a charge uh, to mass ratio of these particles. And he found that these particles were about 2,000 times lighter than a hydrogen atom. Now at the time, that was very profound. What did Dalton say? Are there any particles smaller than an atom? J.J. Thompson just found something 2,000 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. Why is the hydrogen atom and something 2,000 times smaller than it so profound? Hydrogen. Because hydrogen is the smallest atom, isn't it? So if we found something 2,000 times smaller, we have found our first subatomic particle. And it's called the <laughs> electron. A cathode ray tube is the forerunner of the television tube. It is a glass tube from which most of the air has been evacuated. When the two metal plates are connected to a high voltage source, the negatively charged plate, called the cathode, emits an invisible ray. The cathode ray is drawn to the positively charged plate, called the anode, where it passes through a hole and continues traveling to the other end of the tube. When the ray strikes the specially coated surface, the cathode ray produces a strong fluorescence or bright light. When an electric field is applied across the cathode ray tube, the cathode ray is attracted by the plate bearing positive charges. Therefore, a cathode ray must consist of negatively charged particles. We know these negatively charged particles as electrons. A moving charge body behaves like a tiny magnet and it can interact with an external magnetic field. The electrons are deflected by the magnetic field. As expected, when the direction of the external magnetic field is reversed, the beam of electrons is deflected in the opposite direction. In 1897, J.J. Thomson, an English physicist, determined the charge-to-mass ratio of an electron. He adjusted the electric field so that the electrostatic deflection, theta E, was the same as the magnetic deflection, theta B, and was able to calculate the charge-to-mass ratio of an electron using the following equation where E is the applied electric field, theta is the angle of deflection, B is the applied magnetic field, and L is the distance traveled by the cathode rays. Thomson determined the charge to mass ratio of an electron to be negative 1.76 times 10 to the 8th coulombs per gram.
Hey guys, today I'm taking apart an electrostatic uh, cathode ray tube. This is uh, what you would find in an old-fashioned oscilloscope. Uh, so it was actually a very small oscilloscope. The whole screen diameter is only about three inches. And I used a diamond uh, cutoff wheel and a dremel, and I cut the back of the tube open and then pulled out the guts. So this, the ele whole electron gun assembly was inside there, and cut the screen off. I'm going to use the screen in another project, that phosphor screen. It's probably a zinc sulfide screen or something. It's got a nice green dot. And um, I think I might use the heater out of this in another project as well. So the glass tube is, uh, has a coating on the inside. And I, I don't know how to pronounce this. Aqua dag? Aqua dag? Whatever. It's, it's basically a graphite slurry that was poured inside there to make the inside of the tube conductive. So the idea is that you don't want uh, electrons charging up this glass tube, so they, they added that conductive coating in there. So the way the cathode ray tubes work uh, is by accelerating electrons and slamming them into a fluorescent screen. So in this case, the electrons start out over here at the beginning of the electron gun and are focused, accelerated, and deflected by this whole assembly here and make their way all the way out to the front where they hit the screen and the fluorescent uh, phosphor there produces a, a spot of light where the electrons are striking. So this technology I guess is kind of going out of style. I mean with plasma and LCD monitors there's not really much need for this anymore. Uh, there are a few benefits though. One is that the screen can update extremely fast. So for analog oscilloscopes you can have the trace moving extremely fast, I mean much faster than you can see with your eye, and so the phosphor has a persistence to it, so that as the trace goes tearing across the screen, the phosphor actually shows a line where that electron beam was moving, even though the beam itself was going much too fast to see. So uh, let's uh, take a closer look at the gun here and see what's going on inside there. Okay, so here's a close-up of the electron gun assembly and the electrons start out inside this metal can here. So this uh, uses a, a so-called thermionic cathode where there's a tungsten filament there that gets very hot. This is partially why TVs have so much heat coming out the back. Most of the heat that the tube uses is wasted in this filament here just as thermal energy that comes off. But some of that energy is used to so-called boil off electrons off of this cathode and what happens is there's sort of a cloud of free electrons inside this can. Uh, after you have the cloud of electrons there, we want to shoot them at the screen, and the way to do that is to put a potential difference in this cloud area. So this can is at a positive voltage, and this one is at a negative voltage, and as soon as the electrons get into that space between the cans, they experience a very high acceleration force. So when I say potential difference, we're talking about, I think for this particular CRT, it was maybe a thousand volts. Uh, for color TVs, it's quite a bit higher, uh, but for monochrome oscilloscope type things with just electrostatic deflection, it's, it's really need like a thousand volts, maybe two thousand, depending how big the screen is. And then you'll see as the electrons continue down through here, there's more of these cans, electrodes to deal with and these handle the focusing operation. So as the electrons are beamed through here, they naturally want to repel from each other because they have similar charges, uh, just sort of like two pieces of styrofoam that sort of push against each other. The little electrons try to separate out, and the purpose of these electrodes is to focus the beam into a pretty narrow path. Uh, we don't want the beam too narrow, though, because if it strikes the phosphor screen with a tiny little point, uh, the dot isn't going to be big enough to see. So really the goal is to get a dot that's maybe half a millimeter or a millimeter in diameter when the system is at perfect focus. Um, so after we get through this electrode here, the beam is hopefully focused and will produce a, a correctly sized spot on the screen. And the last part of this gun are these deflection plates. So you can see that there are two plates 
and they're, they angle out at the end, and this, this is sort of, let's say this is the y direction. If I turn this thing around, you can see that there's plates uh, orthogonal, so it handles both axes there. And by putting a potential difference across these plates, the beam will deflect, and of course, in either axis. Here's a shot looking down the end of the gun, and what you're seeing are the two deflection plates for one of the axes, and the hole is the last focusing electrode there. Let's take a closer look at the focusing assembly. So what we have here is one entire metal can uh, electrode that spans from here all the way to here. Then there's a middle one and one at the end again. And as you can see, these two electrodes, the first one and the last one, are joined together electrically. And the middle one is at a different potential. There, there's a different line that takes that one out, outside the tube. And uh, this is known as an Einzel lens. Uh, an electro when, when you have electrodes spaced like this, you can call it a lens, because as the beam of electrons uh, fires through the middle, the effect of these potential differences causes the beam to focus. So it actually is very analogous to light optics and uh, a convex lens of sorts. So the uh, voltages on these are fairly high, too. They're on the order of the accelerating voltage. So if this tube is operating at 1,000 volts, maybe there's going to be 800 volts to focus it. Uh, so in that case, this can and the last can would be at the accelerating voltage of 1,000, and the middle electrode would be at 800 or something like that. I actually didn't use this tube before I took it apart, so I'm not exactly sure. Here's another structure that's interesting. Uh, most vacuum tubes have this. This is called a getter. And the function of this is actually just to keep the atmosphere inside the tube as clean as possible. So it actually doesn't have any effect on the electronics of the gun. Uh, its purpose is to deposit some usually a reactive metal like magnesium or something like that on the inside of the glass and so actually I should have taken a shot of this first now it just looks like a bunch of white ash inside here but originally it was probably a shiny little patch of metal and so if you look at most vacuum tubes you'll see that there's like a a very shiny sort of a mirrored surface on the inside and the purpose of that is just to um, absorb oxygen and other impurities that might uh, come out of substances inside the tube. So for example, if there are some oxygen atoms that are uh, stuck on the surface of this metal can, when they put the tube together and suck out all of the air, there might be some oxygen that slowly leaches out and would degrade the performance of the tube. So as sort of extra insurance, this little getter here deposits uh, aluminum on the outside or the on the inside of the glass, and those oxygen atoms will bond with the uh, magnesium or aluminum or whatever it is and form an oxide which is stable so it gets the molecules out of the uh, out of the vacuum inside there and maintains a good vacuum okay so here's a uh, a little bit more modern oscilloscope still fairly old this is a full analog oscilloscope and it has a CRT that's very similar to the one that I just took apart uh, but it has a few small updates which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute but I wanted to show you this deflection voltage idea so in the old in the gun that we saw earlier uh, it has these deflection plates and I said that if you put a potential difference across these plates the electron beam as it's coming through here will get deflected and that's how the dot is moved on the screen so let's see that in action what I've got here is the X deflection voltage the, the actual difference between these plates being measured on the meter over there and right now it's just about zero and the dot is pretty close to the center so if I turn this so that the dot moves to the right we can see the voltage is climbing and it's hitting about a hundred volts as the dot is hitting the right side of the screen and if we go all the way over to the left side of the screen we've got negative 86 volts so pretty close. The, the actual center is not quite in the center of the screen. So if I dial this to zero volts, we're about half a division to the left. Now, interestingly, if we monitor the, the y-axis, the voltages are not as high. And the reason for that is that the, the y-axis deflection plates are closer to the front so that they have a bigger effect on where the electron will end uh, on the screen. 
So for example, if the electron is deflected in the y direction first, it has a longer to go before it hits the screen, and therefore it'll have a higher deflection uh, for the same acceleration uh, due to these plates here. So you might wonder, if this is using electrostatic beam deflection, what's going on with this coil of wire over here? This is a, a, um, a trace rotation uh, equalizer. So if there's a part of the coil, or if there's a part of the CRT or some other piece in the oscilloscope that gets slightly magnetized, the beam of electrons will rotate about the center of the CRT axis. So this sets up a magnetic field that you can control uh, with the trace rotation control on the front, and that will fix the beam uh, and make it perfectly level with the, with the um, division markings on the front of the screen. So in this case, the magnetic field is circling around that coil of wire, so the field is basically going in the direction of the uh, electron beam, and that will cause it to rotate about the center of that coil. This oscilloscope also has an interesting adjustment called astigmatism. And watch what this does. Now generally you can't adjust the astigmatism from the front panel because it's something that is set at the factory. Uh, what's happening here is the voltage between the deflection plates, there's another electrode hiding between the, the, the X and the Y deflection plates that has a different voltage on it. And by changing that voltage, uh, the beam is either flattened out in the x direction or in the y direction. So in conjunction with the focus control, the beam can be made into a nice round point. If the astigmatism is off, you may not get a very good focus. And if it's way off, you end up with a flat little squished pancake looking kind of a thing there instead of a nice dot. Uh, the tube that I took apart before, that small one, and showed the electron gun, that one did not have an astigmatism control because it used the same um, focus voltage. So there was no separate adjustment on that one. All right, well, I hope this is helpful. See you next time.